Good morning, Senate Judiciary, uh, January 21st, 2021. This morning, our agenda is to discuss the Justice Reinvestment Working Group's recommendations regarding probation. And um, we have uh, with us uh, Sarah Friedman from the Justice Center who will present that portion of it. And then we will talk about a bill that is still in draft form that will be introduced dealing with probation. So um, if we could start with uh, Sarah, welcome to Senate Judiciary. And uh, Sarah is with the Council of State Governments Justice Center out of, well, the Justice Center is in New York City but, and uh, Seattle and Austin and Washington, D.C. and somewhere else. Uh, basically all over the place because now we're yeah, all remote. All the, yeah, because everybody's <laughs> remote, remote, you're all over the place. <laughs> uh, welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Sears, committee members. Uh, just um, to repeat, I'm Sarah Friedman. I'm a deputy program director at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here to uh, walk you all through uh, the work of the Justice Reinvestment Two Working Group. Um, on, and specifically on their probation policy options. Um, so the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group actually had a report due to you all on January 15th. Um, uh, and that's what I'm gonna kind of start with. Uh, the report covers a few things, including probation, but I figure for this, we're focusing on probation. I can give you kind of a brief refresher background on who the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group is and then dive into the conversations that they had over fall 2020 on uh, probation earned credit, strengthening the midpoint review process and just ways uh, to safely help people earn discharge from probation. Would it be easier to have the screen, um, have Peggy or yeah. Bryn or somebody put on the screen the working group um, report? Yeah, I can actually share my screen. I have it up. Um, okay. so let me let let me hopefully make that happen. Uh, here we go. Can can you all yep. see this? Yep. Hold on. And now hopefully you see it large. Yep, in large uh, form. Okay. Yep. Now we do. Yep. Nice. Okay, so uh, so this is just so if, when you uh, if if folks are looking through the entire report, this is just the title page of the report that was due January fifteenth. There's five sections to the report. I'm really going to just briefly go over section one, just as a background introduction, and talk about section two. I hope that you know at other dates we'll be able to talk, walk you through the other sections of the report. Um, my colleague David Demora, who you all may know, may remember, he's been kicking around Vermont for a really long time now, uh, helping with projects here. He's really the expert on the mental health and substance use pieces of this uh, report. And at some point, I, I would love for him all to talk to you about that part. But I'm focusing yep. on one and two here. Right. Um, so, so just as a reminder about Justice Reinvestment 2 in Vermont, um, the, the process started in June 2019 when state leaders from all three branches of the government wrote a letter. Oh, no. One second. I'm sorry, I hope that sounded okay for you guys. Yeah. Uh, my phone just dropped. Uh, wrote a letter um, you know, to uh, the federal government, to the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Assistance, who funds this project, really asking for the CSG Justice Center to come in, analyze, uh, analyze Vermont's criminal justice system and help the state propose policy changes that would improve Vermont's criminal justice system. Um, that process uh, began the Justice Reinvestment II Working Group, who met throughout fall of 20, uh, 2019 and culminated in policies that were adopted in the 2020 legislative session and uh, turned into Act 148, which was enacted in July 2020. So this is really like the two sentence version of a huge amount of work um, that was done by Vermonters and um, the CSG phase one, uh, CSG Justice Center staff, or what we call our Justice Reinvestment 
uh, team led by Ellen uh, Whelan Weist, who I'm sure um, you all probably remember very well. <laughs> so, yes. um, so that's everything. That that is it in a nutshell. And you know, Act 148 has wa some wide-reaching policy changes. Um, around presumptive parole, streamlining the parole system, a whole bunch of stuff, which is listed here. But um, for this conversation, the really important thing <clears throat> um, is that uh, Section 21 of Act 148 continues the justice reinvestment to working group. So um, at the time, it was an 18-member body. Now it's a 19-member body, which I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show you who's on it in just a second. Um, and it really gave, uh, it continued the working group and gave them additional tasks. So it said, hey, Justice Reinvestment to Working Group, we want you to oversee the implementation of policy changes uh, for Justice Reinvestment as that progresses. And also, the, um, there are some additional studies. We'd like you to evaluate additional policies moving forward. Um, so just trying to switch the slide. So um, this is the Justice Reinvestment Two Working Group, 19 member body, uh, Senator Sears and Senator, Senator Nitka are on it. Um, so they know this really well, uh, chaired by the, it continues to be chaired by the Chief Justice um, and, uh, and just has people from all three branches, different actors from all across Vermont's criminal justice system, putting their heads together um, on how to improve uh, criminal justice policy in the state and also overseeing implementation of policies that have passed. And just to note, the, uh, the one change in this from uh, the last time the working group met is that a representative of the parole board was added um, onto the group to make it a 19-member group, uh, and that is Mary Jane Ainsworth, uh, represent, uh, the director of the Vermont Parole Board, is now on the group. So um, the, the Justice Reinvestment to Phase Two timeline. So once Act 148 was enacted, uh, the CSG team, kind of the Phase One team, who go, went through the working group process for the first time, passed the baton to my team, uh, who really focuses on implementation of policies once they've been passed. Um, so uh, Vermont state leaders, again from all three branches, had to to write requesting that CSG stick around and help with implementation. Um, and BJ approved that in August. Um, and then the working group hit the ground running again and met four times between September uh, and January 2021 to tackle their statutory duties facilitated by the CSG Justice Center team. And while this is happening, um, you know, we're focusing right now on the working group and the probation policy options, but just to be clear, while the working group process is happening, your state agencies are also, you know, doing a ton of different implementation work that the CSG team is, is helping out with, um, setting up data monitoring, uh, you know, doing, uh, getting policies and procedures in place, and, and a whole bunch of stuff preparing for January 1 effective dates of Act 148 policies. Um, so... The Act 148 kind of gave the working, the Justice Reinvestment to Working Group a long list of areas to study and make recommendations. And since we were on a pretty short timeline, since there was also this January 15th report due, um, the, at the first meeting, the working group discussed how they were going to tackle, what they were going to tackle then, or, you know, what they were going to prior, prioritize specifically for the report due on January 15th. Um, and the first thing that was decided to prioritize, which also kind of needed to be prioritized in statute, quite frankly, was studying earned time for people on probation and other related policy options. Um, that was kind of required to be reported on in the January 15, 2021 report, as opposed to other things that had flexibility to go into the January 15, 2022 report. Um, in addition to the probation conversation, the working group did also decide to tackle three kind of interrelated tasks related on uh, related to mental health and substance use needs for people in the criminal justice system, and really specifically about information sharing, uh, case coordination, uh, collaboration, um, and uh, collaboration among, on services for for all of the different agencies and people who uh, people working with folks um, with behavioral health needs in the criminal justice system. So. I am skimming over these now, but ha we are definitely happy to dig in much further into them at a later date. So this is just the really quick schedule of the four different meetings that uh, took place in uh, of the Justice Reinvestment Working Group. 
Um, and just for this conversation in, Octo in October, the group really looked at data related to Vermont's probation system. And I'm gonna give a really high level preview of what that data was. Um, and then that conversation on probation was continued in November. We honestly kind of ran out of time in the October meeting. And so working group uh, members continued to discuss these probation policy, you know, of probation earned credit or other related policies in the November meeting. Um, the November meeting also dug into behavioral health, the substance use and mental health, and um, and we discussed justice reinvestment funding and appropriation recommendations for the upcoming budget cycle should funding be available. So that leads us up just to last Monday, January 11th, where the working group came together uh, and was presented with policy options that were adopted around all of the different um, all of the different policy areas that the, the group was studying. So. <clears throat> When I think through uh, the work that the probation that the working group did on the probation earned credit, one thing that I do want to be clear about is that this has been a really long-standing conversation in Vermont that existed long before the CSG team was running around helping you all analyze your system. Um, and it's, it's where our understanding is that this has just been a conversation for a number of years where folks were just having trouble coming to consensus on, you know, what, what the best mechanism might be in order to help people earn time off of their, um, off of their probation sentences. So um, it comes out of uh, the working group tackling, it comes out of these statutory duties, but I do want to note it's a little, it's a little bit different for the CSG team because we didn't tackle this policy because our phase one data analysis led us there. We tackled it because Vermonters are saying, hey, like we've been talking about this for years and we need like extra facilitation on figuring out how to get there. So that I just want to note that you're going to see a little bit of a different approach. If you've heard Ellen present on these things or, you know, you've seen what CSG has done in the past. We're taking, we took a little bit of a different approach to this because we were kind of in, we were coming in like midway through a very long conversation Vermont was having on this um, and really fa facilitating it, but also trying to lead you guys in a direction that you were going without, I guess, unduly uh, influencing where you wanted to go. Um, because honestly, the data wasn't quite there for us to do our normal thing, which was to, you know, like find the really obvious policy that you that we could say, hey, you should definitely do this. And I'm going to walk you through that. Um, I think it's important that. to, if I give a little bit of a history, uh, Sarah, when we did Justice Reinvestment 1, we did make some changes to probation because what the Justice Center did find at that time was that we had around 12,000 people on probation, many of them were dead. Um, <laughs> Others who have been on for 30 years because they hadn't paid a fine or hadn't paid a surcharge or whatever. So we made significant changes and we reduced the probation population to around 8,000. And it continues to be less today with diversion and other alternative justice. But I, it's important to note where we were uh, back in 2010 when we did the first justice for investment. Just as a, uh... yeah. Th thank you, Senator Sears. That's really helpful. Um, so, just digging in, Act 148 actually had a, a good amount of language on this, and I think these kind of questions that were in Act 148 were the result of these years of conversations about this, um, and particularly the result of, a, I think, a, a pretty robust conversation that was had <laughs> during the 2020 legislative session. So the working group was specifically tasked with, was tasked with evaluating a policy for people earning one day of credit towards their suspended sentence for each day served in the community without a violation. So that was kind of, there was already kind of some details hammered out, you can say, on the basics of what an earned credit policy would look like. But the working group was also asked to kind of think through a variety of questions, like how, how would Vermont implement this policy without impacting probation, the length of probation terms or suspended sentences? You know, sh if there's a credit uh, um, enacted, should that credit apply to the maximum or the minimum suspended sentence? Um, uh, 
you know, and kind of kind of walks through some pretty specific questions. And along along with that says, you know, please study additional options for early discharge from probation, including options modeled after Vermont's current midpoint review process. And I point out that one specifically because the working group discussion really ended up going there, which you'll see reflected. So when, when the CSG Justice Center team kind of hopped in to start facilitating this conversation, one thing that we really wanted to talk about to the working group was, hey, what are your goals for this policy? You know, different people enact similar or different states enact these policies for a variety of reasons. And if we're leading the conversation, it would be really helpful to understand what Vermonters are hoping to get out of a, a policy or something similar. Um, so one uh, you know, and some of these are pretty easy. So we know that these these policies provide um, people on probation an increased incentive for positive behavior change. So it's kind of like the uh, kind of evidence based practices tell us that incentives or you know rewards for good behavior actually are really really important for creating behavior change for people in the criminal justice system. And this is you can think of it as the ultimate reward. If I'm doing really well, if I have good behavior, if I do everything I need to do and prove that I'm a good citizen while I'm in the community, you know, I can earn a short, you know, I can earn time off my sentence. It's, it's a really powerful motivator for people um, to increase kind of individual public safety. Um, another, another really common goal for policies like these is uh, also focused on public, sa public safety, increasing probation resources uh, for people who are most likely to reoffend. So if all the people who are really motivated and are doing really well on supervision are, you know, uh, are able to earn time off their sentence and transition off, then your probation officers are able to focus their time and resources and attention, all the folks who are not doing well on probation, the folks that need a lot of support, who are messing up, who kind of need that intensive supervision, well, now they have more time and attention for people who, for people like that. So it's, it's really, a, um, it, it also is really about resource allocation often in states enacting these policies. Now, where I think folks on the working group were kind of um, not all necessarily on consensus was about where in Vermont this policy, was this policy for decreasing the length of incarceration for a person who gets revoked from probation. So if they're successful for a time in the community and then are revoked, mess up and are revoked back to prison, should this policy decrease that length of incarceration or is the goal of this policy to, to decrease the overall probation term? And I think a lot of people on the working group will say both, <laughs> definitely. But I, I think that I, through the conversation, there were some folks um, on different pages on, is the ultimate goal about the amount of time someone can spend in prison once they mess up on probation or is the ultimate goal about reducing the probation term successfully? And so there was conversation about that. Um, during the working group meeting. So what we could do, what CSG Justice Center staff, uh, staff could do was really, we wanted to see, well, what, do, what does the data tell us? What can we tell you about your probation system? So if you all are thinking about shortening probation length um, and about what happens once someone um, is revoked from probation, then what we wanna know is, well, how long are probation lengths currently and when do people tend to be revoked for probation? How long are people successful on probation? Um, or you know, how long until they mess up? And so we did a data analysis focused on, on kind of what the current probation system looks like. I have a selection of slides here. This is actually a good deal shorter than what we initially presented in the October meeting. I'm gonna to try to go through them quickly to not get like too stuck in the data. Um, but if you're more interested in, if you're like a really quantitative person and you want more charts about the probation uh, system, there's more, um, there's kind of a more in-depth version of this presentation uh, took place in October. So if you look at misdemeanor probation length, um, almost all probation lengths, people who get misdemeanor probation have terms of two years or less. And it's, it's really consistent in Vermont. And this is likely due to the fact that you do have a state law on the books that states that misdemeanor sentences are not to exceed two years unless the court deems a longer period appropriate. Mm -hmm. It seems very uncommon for the court to deem a longer period appro appropriate. So you see in this chart, you know, the majority or, uh, of 
folks uh, get 12 month terms Ooh. and uh, uh, the majority of folks get 12 month terms on probation. And then you do also have kind of a spike at 24 months. So a lot of people do get 24 month terms of probation terms. But the thing about Vermont probation or Vermont probation sentences is they actually have three components. You have the length of time someone is sentenced to be on probation supervision. And then you also have an underlying suspended sentence that has a minimum term and a maximum term. And the point of that suspended sentence is that if someone is revoked, if they mess up on their supervision, um, then that is the period of incarceration that they can serve um, uh, once they mess up on their probation. And so when we look at misdemeanor probation terms, the minimum and maximum tends to be actually a lot shorter than the actual probation term. So, um, so the, across all different probation term lengths, ten, people tend to have a three to nine month sentence for that underlying incarceration. Um, and if you look at these longer, people who do get the longer misdemeanor probation terms, you know, there tends to not be a max sentence over one year. So no matter how long your probation term, you're, when you mess up, you're very unlikely to go into incarceration for over a year in Vermont. Um, <clears throat> And just to note also, you know, we're looking at these minimum and maximum sentences because that was part of the statutory duties, you know, should a credit apply to the minimum, should a credit apply to the maximum. Um, <clears throat> so for felony probation terms, it looks a little bit different. Uh, the guidance on the books for felony probation terms is that they should generally not exceed four years uh, unless the court deems the period uh, appropriate. But in a good number of cases, the court has deemed uh, the period appropriate, and you do have a decent number of folks who have been sentenced to five years on probation. Um, so you see here, if you're looking at this chart, kind of all the spikes of the blue bars are on the year mark. So a lot of people at two years, a lot of people at three years, um, and then the, the next two the spikes are four and five years. But still, in general, very unusual for anyone to get over five years um, for a probation term. Uh, generally, you know, people are on felony probation or sentenced to felony probation to five years or less. The minimum and maximum sentences do look a bit different. So for folks who are sentenced to more than two years of felony probation, their maximum sentence generally uh, is the same as their probation length. So you're sentenced to three years of probation, and if you mess up, they can put you in incarceration for a maximum of three years. However, for two years and less, the maximum is actually longer. So if you're, so for a typical person, they're sentenced to two years of probation, but they could, if they mess up, they could actually be incarcerated for a maximum of three years. So that's kind of a, a pretty interesting um, uh, kind of what have you on how probation sentencing structures work. But generally for felony probation sentences, um, across all different felony probation sentences lengths, that underlying sentence tends to be, is typically one to three years. So now just looking at when do, when are people revoked from probation? Um, so that is really thinking through what is that public safety risk? So for misdemeanor probation on average across all different probation sentence lengths, um, a person who messes up and gets revoked would, will do so in their seventh month of supervision. So really early on within that first year. Um, most, most revocations for misdemeanor probation occur well within the first half of someone's sentence. Um, so you see here on this chart, it's just based on um, how long the probation length is, when is a person typically revoked or the, the average time to revocation. And, you know, so for on misdemeanor probation. So, you know, for folks who tend to have one year probation terms, they're usually revoked with it. If they mess up, they mess up in their fifth month. That's what this chart shows. So, Can I ask and, a question and, about know, that, Sarah? Yeah, definitely. Please. So, so the, the numbers on the bottom are the, the um, amount of time they were um, put on probation for like the two years um, it, they're on probation for two years and they typically uh, screw up during um, the first eight months. Is that the way I read this? Yep. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so now we have the same chart for people who are on felony probation, have been sentenced to felony probation. So, um, 
so, and this is actually in some ways pretty similar. It's well within the first half of the sentence are people who, if you're revoked, you, you're typically revoked well within the first half of your sentence. Um, you have on average across all the different felony probation lengths, a person would be revoked in their 11th month of supervision. So again, even before their first year is up. Um, but it looks a little bit different, you know, based on the, the length of sentence. So, for example, this chart shows, um, you know, if you're sentenced to two years of felony probation, uh, of that person is typically revoked. If, if they get revoked, they're typically revoked, you know, within their eighth month uh, on, uh, on probation. Sorry, was there another question? No, thanks. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is to say we were able to, I think, dig in and kind of give, give folks on the working group a pretty good picture of kind of what probation sentencing structures look like. But we also knew that Vermont currently had a few different mechanisms on the book to shorten people's probation sentences. And we weren't able to access any data or we, we didn't really, we couldn't figure out how those mechanisms were currently being used and what that looked like. So just so you know, there's um, DOC is able to file a petition anytime someone completes their conditions of supervision, uh, whenever that is, DOC can petition to, for them to be discharged. And then there's also the midpoint review process that at halfway through someone's probation term, DOC may file a motion to discharge people who are, who are doing well. Um, so we knew these existed, but we still, we don't have any picture of how well they're used. There's a lot of anecdotes that they're used a lot or they're used a little, it depends who you talk to. Um, and, and, and even if the petitions are filed, no idea if judges were approving them, how long people were earning off their sentence, et cetera. So we kind of felt like what was currently happening around this in the state is, is a black box. Um, which is not what, you know, quantitative people want to hear, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, you know, so, and so what we have here on this slide is just a list of things that we really wanted, the questions we, we wanted answers to, to really help you all have a full picture of what was going on to Vermont, but we weren't able to answer. So, you know, not only what's going on with those current mechanisms, but also, you know, um, how do those minimum and maximum suspended sentences correlate with the actual amount of time someone spends in prison? We only know how long they could spend in prison. We don't know how long they actually do spend in prison, um, you know, because we do know people often go from probation out onto furlough. You know, they're just they're just moved into a different type of community supervision. Um, and on the same line, for people who do mess up on probation, go back into DOC custody and then come out pretty quickly on furlough, what are those, you know, what are their outcomes for those people on furlough? Um, you know, they've just moved to a different type of community supervision. What does that look like? Um, uh, you know, so, and then all of, and then a whole host of questions, as I said, on, you know, what's currently happening in the state. So even though we couldn't answer all the questions we wanted to to Vermont specifically, what we can say is there's a lot of national data to support these policies. So 38 states uh, across the country have some form of either earned compliance credit or earned discharge for people on community supervision. But of course, those policies can be structured wildly differently depending on what state you're in. And uh, during that October meeting, we did walk uh, the working group through three or four state examples, one being Montana, which uh, came up a lot, but we, I think it was Montana, Missouri, um, Michigan, and one other. I think we were, we were on an M state role, apparently, <laughs> um, uh, where we kind of walked through what different policies states have enacted around this and how they can be structured differently. Um, so again, we didn't, this isn't in this report now for the sake of kind of brevity, but those are available. Um, and then really interestingly, between the third and fourth working group meeting, uh, Pew released a really comprehensive study of these policies specifically. It was one of those things where it came out in December and the working group had just finished talking about this on November 24th. And it was like, oh, the timing, <laughs> um, this would have really informed the conversation. So Pew, there's, a, there's now a really comprehensive study from Pew that walks through the national right. data on these policies that help people right. earn time off their probation terms. 
Um, and, and that comprehensive study does find that many people are on supervision, who are on supervision serve longer terms than are necessary for public safety. And you, that uh, these that have an mm -hmm. Sarah, could, would it be possible for you to get a copy of the Pew study to um, Peggy so she could post it on our committee webpage? Yeah, definitely. Will do. Or, or, and also, Peggy, if you were able to uh, provide any committee members with hard copies of both the Pew study and the entire yes. Justice Reinvestment Two Working Group document, it would be appreciated. I think most committee members would, would want to have the hard copy of the Thank you. 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 No problem. So yeah, I will send that on. It's, it's a longer read, but it's definitely worth it. Um, it does walk through a few different states that were able to study their earned discharge or earned credit policies and found that it did not, you know, negatively impact public safety, which is really important. You know, you can that that states are able to safely reduce terms um, without that impact on public safety. So the, the real um, kind of the conclusion of the report is that the study recommends to state policymakers that they do adopt similar policies to what Vermont is considering. And, and this is the three kind of types of policies that Pew lays out. One is this goal-based supervision to prioritize outcomes as opposed to time-based supervision. So as uh, we talked about on that, on the goal slide to uh, allow people to earn, to earn time off their sentence for good behavior. Um, earned compliance credits that promote, uh, do promote positive behavior change, encourage compliance, increase successful outcomes, and reduce caseloads. And then also, they recommend an automatic review of supervision to ensure that states use clear and definable guidelines to determine eligibility for earned discharge to ensure fairness. So all things that uh, the working group discussed and kind of was uh, going towards them themselves. So, so coming out of this, what the CSG Justice Center team did is after the October and November conversations on earned discharge policies and midpoint reviews and earned credits, um, we worked, since this was, as we said, we didn't have all the data we wanted about this policy and we were kind of jumping in midway into an ongoing Vermont conversation we worked to, to develop or to present to the working group two different policy options that we felt like reflected back to the working group the conversations they had in those two meetings. So um, usually when CSG presents policy options, just to you know put our cards on the table, we call them policy options, but we really want Vermont to adopt all of them. They're really, you know, we, they're, they're things that we think that you all should do. It was a little different this time. This time we said we kind of presented two policy options and we said we really think these are either or you either do an earned credit policy or you do an earned discharge policy so time based versus credit accrual. Um, and the way we have developed these is reflecting back to you where we think folks in the state are on these. Um, since we don't have all of the data to model policy changes the way we normally would. So. Um, option one was sticking with the credit accrual policy. You know, the basis of uh, the statutory language in Act 148 to study was that day for day credit for folks on probation. There were some working group members who felt strongly about this. And, and the kind of the recommendation was if you all want to do a day for day credit as an ongoing has, has been a conversation for a few years in Vermont, definitely apply that to the, to the underlying minimum sentence. And then there's an option to apply it to the underlying minimum sentence until there is only 15 or 30 days remaining to ensure a minimum of term uh, of incarceration is available for revocation if needed, which was really a compromise uh, way to structure the policy. Um, once the conversation in the working group meeting happened, uh, option one was not adopted in favor of option two, which I'm about to present. And, and that is to say, we did say, we think you should do one or the other, not both. So it makes sense. Um, basically the working group uh, chose the other option. I do wanna <laughs> note though, that there was comment and the ACLU did say, hey, we still like the earned credit policy. Um, and we don't think this has to be either or, we think this could be a both and, you could do both of these. And so we did kind of register that comment in the report that, you know, not everyone felt like it was one or the other. 
So the option that was adopted was to strengthen Vermont's current midpoint review process to make it more presumptive and encourage its use using a model of earned discharge policies from other states such as Montana. Um, so, and then these bullet points here kind of are a very high level. If you look at Vermont's current midpoint review statute, you know, go from DOC may file a motion at midpoint review for DOC shall file the motion. Um, uh, as in Montana, require judges to grant the request for discharge unless they determine it's not in the best interest of the person on probation or would present a risk of danger to the victim. And then also to make, to, to make sure that even if a person is not um, eligible or is not granted discharge at their midpoint, they have other opportunities to earn discharge. So kind of, you know, if, if they're not doing well at the midpoint, but they get their act together, that they can still kind of work their way to earning some time off the end of their sentence. So that's kind of the very short version of uh, what Bryn has been working on. Um, and this was what the this is what the working group did end up adopting. Um, there is a note that the the network against domestic and sexual violence did speak up during this and say, you know, that they thought it would be really important to make sure uh, that the rights of victims are taken into consideration and that there's a proper notification uh, and communication processes around this um, as it moves forward. So that's noted in the report. Um, but this is this is kind of where consensus landed within the working group is taking a mechanism already on the books in Vermont, which we don't know exactly how it's working, and just like really beefing it up and making it more like traditional earned discharge policies in other states. So that um, that that's the that's really the crux of it. One the one last thing is just a reminder from us is that no matter how you strength you structure your probation system, if you really want to reduce revocations and reduce people going to prisons, you've still got to focus on um, strengthening the effectiveness of how people are being supervised in the community and uh, ensuring that people receive the services they need, especially around mental health substance use. Um, and co-occurring disorders and increasing those, you know, community-based resources. So um, just, just a reminder from us, we can't help ourselves that you all, you know, there's a, you, there's kind of like a, a robust um, and holistic way we have to be, uh, the state should be uh, tackling this if we want people to be successful on probation and limiting their incarcerative sentences. And, and this is also to say you all are doing this as part of Act 148. Um, your DOC is working really hard on it improving supervision practices and making them more aligned with evidence-based practices and formalizing incentives and all of that. So these are things you're doing, but they all go hand in hand. I just <clears throat> comment that <clears throat> uh, I think this is the most critical area and given that three members of Senate Judiciary are on the Senate Appropriations Committee, this is where we really need to build a fence around the money that saved in from justice reinvestment to, and that it's spent on community services, particularly for um, offenders who are on probation. I think sometimes we focus on other offenders who are out in the community, those on furlough, those on um, parole, uh, perhaps, but, and those, you know, who are receiving alternative sentences like diversion. I really think we have to focus on these probationers. That's where um, I can't think of the percentages we found in the initial report, but it's what around 70% of the returns are probation, parole, or furlough. Yeah, I, you know, I should, but I don't have the exact percentage um, off the top of my head, but I think it's around 70%. But really, the the overwhelming majority of people entering prison are returning from some type of community supervision. So if that's, you know, that this is a place, I might add that, um, that the more we talked about the earned credit versus this particular way to do it, we did, the earned credit was so complex um, that I thought we would get into, into real difficulty in trying to implement it. And I personally, and Joe, you're probably familiar with it now, no Alice is, in a juvenile system, we have uh, a yearly review, I think it's yearly, of any child in custody. 
So that child, you know, you really have to say, this is why the child should be continued in custody or, will, you know, or, or not. And so this, this is the type of review that I hope will come about as a result of this legislation that passes. That it'd be a very serious review of whether or not that person should stay in on probation. Have they completed it and shouldn't they be released? Sarah, thanks so much. I don't know if there's questions for Sarah or Bryn, but it was a really good uh, presentation of where we got to. Um, I felt I, you know, it just doesn't seem to me like there were only four meetings. I felt like I was in a lot more than four. But, <laughs> I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but it. it well, was I'm not either, but it just seems like. I, I don't know if Senator Nick has a comment on that. I, I think it was absolutely incredible the amount of research and data that came from um, the council because of the work that was done. I mean, it was very, very thorough. I mean, you could really look at it and figure out what is what in the system. I, I thought I was really surprised at how much information they were able to get. You know, his, not easy to gather all of that. I mean, we have in judiciary been receiving different things from time to time, but to have this really comprehensive look was really very good and, you know, data driven as, as they say these days all the time. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just so Could you expand a little bit more on the Pew report and the findings that it doesn't affect public safety? to provide this? Um... Yeah, so that's really looking at, it, it's similar to kind of the analysis we started about, you know, when do people, you know, do things adverse to public safety when they're on probation? So when are people tend to be revoked? And and what a few states were doing, and I think it's Missouri specifically, is that they, they tracked people. So after they implemented earned discharge or credit accrual policies, um, they tracked the folks uh, who um, who earned time off their sentence and looked during when they would have been serving. Did those people commit new crimes or do you know things adverse to public safety? And they they found that generally they did not. So that it wasn't. So even when the folks were not on supervision, they um, you know no one suddenly got off supervision and then went back to their criminal lifestyle, etc. Um, they they were main, they continued to be good citizens as they had shown they did when they earned time off their sentence. So there was no uptick in crime from the folks who had their sentences shortened. Hmm. Other questions for Sarah? Can we briefly walk through the bill with both Sarah and Bryn? That might be the most helpful way to see how what CSG found is now making its way into the draft. I believe it's draft 1.3. That's right, um, draft 1.3. And if the committee wants me to put it up on the screen, please let me It'd know. It would probably be helpful since um, I'm probably the only one that went and printed it out this morning. Okay. This is blind faith, I'll tell you. We're signing on without ever having seen it. We don't have any idea what you're saying. Well, well actually, it's it's you can change your mind, but what <laughs> Sarah just reported is what's in it. I suspected that. So yes, and to be clear, it hasn't this is a bill that has not yet been introduced. It's a draft. Um, so it may yet change prior to its introduction. Um, Okay, here it is. So it is draft, hold on. It is draft 1.3. Um, and right now, um, all five of you are, are co-sponsoring it. So you'll let me know if that changes after I walk through it. <laughs> <laughs> so for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. Um, note that this draft, because it's been it's sort of a work in progress, it hasn't been edited yet. So for all of your eagle eyes, um, that if you see something, 
know that our editors haven't reviewed it yet. So, um, and also, Sarah, if you see something, please feel free to jump in. Okay, we'll do. Thanks. So I'll go ahead and walk through it. Let me. I'm going to start by saying um, that. And I think Sarah really did a great job of um, talking about how our statutes currently provide for this midpoint review process and 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 probation in general. Um, but I'll just start out with kind of an overview of what's happening now with respect to the midpoint review. Um, then the changes that this bill makes will, might make a little bit more sense. You'll so um, current. So what this draft uh, changes two statutes. It changes the duration of probation statute. Good. They can't hear it. And then the conditions of probation statute. Um, so what the conditions of probation statute sets out currently is that D, uh, the Department of Correction, Corrections has to review the record of people who are serving probation sentence during the month prior to the midpoint of the probationers um, probation term. Um, so after that review, if the probationer has successfully completed a program assigned as a part of their probation sentence or has attained a goal or goals that were specified by the conditions of their probation, then the department may file a motion with the sentencing court to request that the sentencing court dismiss the remainder of the probation term or requesting that the court deduct a portion of the remaining term based on um, the probationer's success in their programs or attainment of their goals. So that's that's what's happening currently, just as a reminder before we go into what this bill does. So section one is the du duration of probation statute, as I mentioned. And currently the only language um, to the statute is found here um, in what is now subsection A. And it just says that the court that puts, the, puts a person on probation, that's the sentencing court, can terminate that probation and discharge the person at any time if termination is warranted by the conduct of the offender and the ends of justice. So what we've added here is um, some language that refers um, pretty specifically to the following statute, which is in section two, which we'll talk about next. So what this says is that what the court can do changes here. Um, upon the recommendation of the department, the court shall terminate the period of probation and discharge that person prior to the expiration of their term or Grant, grant the specified term deduction, grant a motion to reduce the term um, pursuant to this following statute, unless the court decides that by clear and convincing evidence, discharge is not in the best interest of the person or that discharging the person will, will present a risk of danger to the victim um, or to the community. And it also specifically requires, you see the sentence, this last sentence here, that the court has to set forth the reasons for denying that motion um, on the record. So that is the directive to the court. The next section is the conditions of probation. And this is where we see the directive to DOC. So changes here, we've just added some subheadings. Um, I'm gonna scroll down to, to the substance of the change here. These are all the conditions that the department can place on a person. So here in subsection D, this is where the changes, the bulk of the changes are made. So we have a, we've added a subheading here that specifies that this is the subsection that's talking about um, the department's review and recommendation for discharge from probation. So <clears throat> what this language provides is that the department shall, you see that word shall, file a motion requesting dismissal um, of the remainder of the probationer's term if no, if the person doesn't have a violation within the last six months prior to the department's review of the record and is actively participating in their case plan. <clears throat> Bryn? And, yes? Um, just a question there about the word actively. Mm -hmm. uh, is that meant to be a, a discretionary point for the commissioner? I'm because, not sure about its intent. I do think it reads that way. Because if we have it in there, it sounds like we're deliberately allowing the conditioner more latitude than the shall would seem to indicate. So if, if you got rid of actively and just had participating, it's less liable to argument, I would think. 
Um, I don't disagree with that. Can I okay. follow up on that? Senator Sears? Can yes. you hear me? Oh, yeah. okay. Please. So the uh, other thing I think is that uh, the case plan often involves, oh, anywhere from two to 10 or 12 different, um, I don't know what you'd call them, directives or, I mean, it isn't just one thing. So if somebody is actively participating in seven out of 10, does that mean actively or does that mean they have to be actively participating in 10 out of 10? I think that that needs a little clarification there too. Uh, if I can just add a, a little background Please, yeah. on this, the, the terms that we were using within the Justice Reinvestment 2 meeting was kind of shorthand. We were saying is complying with all of their conditions of supervision or has completed all of their conditions of supervision. Um, and that, so that language that this is kind of fleshing out, like what does it mean to be uh, I think DOC might say com completing all of their conditions of supervision. So I think that this is a place, this is definitely a place where um, that could be edited or modified and, and having input from DOC would probably make a lot of sense as to what, you know, like how do you define kind of with less wiggle room, what it means to be compliant with your conditions of supervision. And so this language is kind of a, a first draft of that or a first stab at that. Um, because saying you've completed or you've been compliant with all your uh, conditions of supervision also feels like it's not quite, um, it could be a little bit too wishy-washy or, you know, it's not quite clear enough. But I, I think that, you know, um, also that, you know, having to have violated terms of probation with the court at the six months prior to consideration is six months the right amount. I think that also could be a conversation with the, the folks who are doing the supervising on, on how they tend to, how they usually look at who is being successful on probation. So yep, just I can be, just throw just out. Be, I'm sorry, Janet, I didn't know you hadn't finished your question. Well, I just was going to throw out one more thing. Broken up, or yep. we, at least frozen. I've lost you. You're frozen. Yeah, I've lost her too. Okay. Um, Joe, why don't you go ahead, and then we'll hopefully get you that back. Yeah, Bryn um, and Sarah, the term that you're using uh, is not consistent with the court documents. They're called probation conditions, and we probably ought to have that term used throughout because. Everybody who enters into a plea agreement that has probation has probation conditions that they have to comply with. And that's what the probation officer is actually supervising those probation conditions. It's just to be consistent with how the court treats the language. Is that, but isn't it part of a case plan? There may be a case plan that is dealt with, but the court is using the term probation conditions, and that's the vernacular that the court is used to. I've never heard this term here uh, of supervision, whatever it was. All right. Um, maybe uh, I would suggest that we take out the word actively now and um, get an opinion from the Department of Corrections on what's the best way to describe the case plan or the conditions. I think that Judge uh, Grierson would probably have a comment in this regard. Yeah, I mean, we are working with a draft of the bill. I'm just suggesting that we leave it at case plan for now. Draft. Is, is this a good time for questions for Bryn or do we keep going from here? No, I can ask Bryn questions. Bryn, can you scroll back to page one for a second? And go down to where changes are being made and hang right there for a second. Uh, 
Um, discharging a person, this is line 19, discharging the person prior to the expiration of the probationer's sentence. I'm uncomfortable with that term only because it, it it's technically the length of the probation. Um, and I'm not sure that I've ever seen or heard the probationer's sentence. Well, we can change that to term. Yeah, I think that's that's probably going to be something that is more consistent with how the courts treat this. Because I'm not sure what the probationer's sentence is. Is it the 6 to 12 underlying or is it the actual probationary term? And I think that changing it would be much clearer. Okay. I, may I, can we, um, that, that's good catch for draft. Can we go back and agree to just drop the word actively and use the term case plan? Because that, you know, I, I think we could, could uh, talk to DOC when obviously they're going to testify on the bill. Good with me. Yep, it's good with me. I'm still not sure what a case plan is in this regard. I've never heard that uh, term used in this area. Of but that's that's the term that that I used when I had kids on probation. They had a case plan within oh, yeah. the facility. I, 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 I agree that in juvenile law, there is a case plan that is constantly revert, reviewed. But as far as an adult criminal on probation, I've never heard that term used before. Part of, part of the problem with with conditions of probation is that the the Vermont Supreme Court made that determination that you know had changed the the terms and so forth on uh, probation. I know that states' attorneys are not happy with that decision. You know what point I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I think that, we're. On we're on the same page in what we're trying to resolve. I just want to make sure the language is consistent with what probation officers actually understand. I, for purposes of introducing the bill, I think we're fine with this terminology and then um, Bryn can flag that with uh, the lawyers over at the DOC. I will, I'll make a note about that. Okay, thanks. And um, there may be a little bit of a, I'm just gonna say that I'll probably change the order of some of these sentences in this section. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, this is a work in progress. So yep. um, it may not look exactly like this. For example, this sentence, the following sentence, which is that the probationer, um, it's will not be considered ineligible um, for a discharge or for a term if um, the probationer has unpaid restitution fees or surcharges, that sentence is gonna move um, down. So I don't think it makes a lot of sense there. Um, and then, so just to jump back into the walkthrough, um, the next, what this ne next sentence provides is that if that um, probationer isn't eligible for dismissal um, because they don't meet the criteria that we talked about earlier, the department may move to request for a reduction in term for comp uh, conditions completed or for goals attained. Brian, can I ask another question? The midterm review, is that something that um, you've spoken with probation about? I've never heard that term only because I'm generally not associated with what happens internally once somebody is placed on probation, but I've never heard that term before. Is that something that's actually happening on every probationary case? Um, so it's supposed to be happening uh, according to statute. Um, if, and I can scroll up and, and show you the language that exists now. Um, so there's a requirement in statute currently that the commissioner review everybody's, um, all probationers records during the month prior to the midpoint of their probation term. And so okay. I think it's generally called the midpoint review. All right. But what it's, it's may, currently it's may go to the court and this would make it shall go to the court. Correct. That, I think that's the biggest difference here. Right, this is sort of a, creating a presumptive process here that, that not only does the commissioner have to review the record, but they also have to file a motion if certain criteria are met. <clears throat> um, 
Okay, and then we're getting to the end here. Um, this new subsection two says that if the commissioner doesn't file a motion um, pursuant to that section that we just looked at, um, or if the court denies the comm commissioner's motion, then it, it directs the department to conduct a review each and every six months following the midpoint review. So if the probationer has not been found by the court to have violated the terms in those six months prior to the review, and here's that language again, is actively participating in their case plan, then it just requires the department to file that motion requesting um, a dismissal of probation at this following six month review process. And again, you'll see the language here again, and that if, they're, if the probationer isn't eligible for dismissal um, for the remainder of their term, but has completed conditions or attained goals, then the commissioner can file a motion requesting a term reduction. And again, probationer is not deemed in ineligible for discharge or term reduction um, if they haven't paid their restitution fees or surcharges. So that just sets up another process. So if the person isn't eligible for that first, at that first midpoint review process, it directs the commissioner to take another look six months later um, and file a motion at that point if the person is eligible. I have a question about that particular provision. Um, what happens to those owed um, fees, surcharges, and restitution, particularly restitution? If they're not, if they're unpaid and the person is released from probation, what do we have to ensure compliance with that provision? Yeah, I'm not, I don't know about that. I know the person remains um, responsible for paying their restitution, but I understand that you're saying that they no longer have that. Um, yeah, that I'm, I'm actually more concerned with restitution than fees or surcharges at this point. I know that to get expunged, you have, you know, we, we've been dealing with the the fees and search are, I'm just worried about um, not paying restitution if um, and how that impacts the person's responsibility to accept accountability for whatever they might have done. Right, so that would be a good um, point to raise with the court administrator, I imagine. And Senator Sears, can I just ask a question on that? Sure. Why on that would not the word get around that, hey, you, in, in reality, you don't have to pay these if this is, is a part of it? Why wouldn't just word get around and say, hey, this isn't going to be one of the requirements, so don't do it? <clears throat> you know, don't pay it. Why wouldn't that word get around that someone, but basically you could skip it. Sarah, in other states, have they done this? Well, um, I would say at large, the concern is that um, if all financial obligations have to be completed in order to earn discharge, you're setting up discharge by class system. So people who have no financial resources are not going to be able to earn time off incarceration and people who come from, you know, wealthier backgrounds are able to earn you know, are able to earn time off their sentence. Thanks. So there is like a, so there's a concern there around equity um, and financial backgrounds on, you know, people um, not wanting essentially to set up a system where people uh, can be good and that people aren't able to shorten their terms because they're from poor backgrounds. But I mean, I and, and I believe that, or for sure, this should not, mean that people have their financial obligations dismissed. But I do understand that there could be a concern that, well, if they're not regularly seeing a supervision officer, then are they gonna actually feel obligated to pay them? So I, I think there is a push pull there, but I would just, um, I, I would say that the concern coming from, from me personally is, does that mean that if you're poor, you can never earn time off your sentence because you have all these financial fees you know, fines and fees hanging over you. And, and, you know, there is a lot of research nationally on how, um, how fines and fees specifically related to criminal justice system really impact people's ability to successfully re-enter and kind of, and um, uh, re-enter the community. 
So that's there. I think I, I, I can see that restitution could be definitely treated differently. Um, and, and you, and that, that could be a point of conversation. Um, uh, but I, that's, that's what I would note there and, and why I would encourage you all to definitely, um, think really deeply about financial obligations and, and how they impact, uh, certain people more than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see what you're saying. I, I would, I would prefer to, to have restitution taken out of there and put a second sentence in there regarding restitution, something to the effect that the court may um, seek alternative for the restitution, but shouldn't. I, I just like to, to have that flag that they, I think restitution is different than fees. And I would have, don't we consider restitution? Maybe I need, maybe I'm not understanding something, but I thought we, uh, considered the offender's ability to pay on restitution. Maybe making the offender have a plan to um, pay off the restitution or something like that. Anyway, flag that. Joe? Yeah, are these fees and restitution subject to a tax intercept for failure to pay? I think so. I know restitution is... Um... I, I'm not sure about the fees. I'd have to check on that. Okay, maybe, maybe we should just do um, restitution separately to make clear that 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 they would be paid under a tax intercept. I mean, maybe made clear to the individual that they're not that, that the the court is not necessarily waiving those. <clears throat> I, I'm really more. I, I'm much more concerned about the restitution. Senator Sears? Yeah. Can I just say that I have no idea what's going on here, but it keeps kicking me off the Wi Fi. Wow. So um, I've been absent for a while, and, um, and then I have to log back in, and I, I don't know what's going on here. Well, I think you need help from IT, but I just had to invest another $40 a month in, an in a better Wi Fi. <laughs> So, if you want to call your your uh, internet provider, be prepared to sign up for an extra forty dollars a month for Wi-Fi. Well, they yeah. just switched to Xfinity. From uh, what we had, so okay. Uh, okay. Anyhow, but I just wanted you to know that I'm not purposely leaving. I I I hear you. And thank you for staying with us. <laughs> All right. I I don't know who's just joined us, Ness. How do we say how we joined? I don't know. Okay. Anyway, um, can we? Uh, uh, any thoughts on the restitution piece? I agree with you that. Um setting up something a little bit different for the restitution piece would be good. I understand what Sarah's saying, that it's an issue of equity, that some people would never get out, but you never get off. Well, but, you know. if, if someone continues to owe the money for restitution, but we allow them to get off their sentence, um, it seems to me that we haven't relinquished their responsibility there, the tax intercept is at least one way to get that money. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not at that point. You can't get blood from a stone. So if they don't have the money, then when they get out of prison is a particularly bad time to demand it of them. So I, I like the way it's written, I guess. There is, there is a restitution unit that is charged with the responsibility of making collections. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's part of probation's responsibility anymore, although I haven't thought about this in a long time. Well, um, I'm so willing to let it go like this, but um, with the understanding that it's going to take a little more research into how we deal with restitution. I would have, I always thought that we had a ability to pay matter with restitution. 
um, yeah. when it's first set, don't we? Yes, when it's first set, but that's subject to review by the court. Um, and I, I believe it's the restitution department that would bring that petition, not probation. Peggy, at some point during the discussion of this bill, I think we're going to need to hear from the rest. Of, is it a restitution unit within the Center for Crime Victim Services or is it a restitution? Correct. Yeah, it's called the, the Vermont Restitution Unit and it's within the Center for Crime Victim Services. Okay, well, I'd like to hear from them uh, when we, at, at some point, when we take up this bill to better understand the restitution. I'd say leave it in the way it's written now and the way the draft is with an understanding that we'll take a good hard look. There, and I would just note that there are avenues for people who are having trouble um, affording their restitution payments to return to the sentencing court and um, and get a, a different arrangement for their payment plan. I mean, I understand everything Sarah and Philip have said, um, and I totally agree with them. On the other hand, when you take this plea agreement, you have agreed to make restitution, and that's part of the obligation and part of taking responsibility for whatever you might have done. Dick, if I'm correct, and probation is no longer supervising the collection of restitution, you may want to talk to somebody from probation as well, because effectively this would be placing that question back into probation to deal with. So the restitution unit is the only unit that's responsible for collecting restitution payments. It's the court that has to collect the fees and the surcharges. I um, think so. And there's, I will note that they, um, that restitution would remain even if the person was released from their probation supervision, the restitution order would remain. And the restitution unit can enforce that, that order as a civil judgment. And um, they can do that by wage withholding, property lien, attachment and sale of assets, suspension of recreational licenses. And then if, they, um, if there's a refusal to pay, then they are subject to civil contempt proceeding. So there. Yeah, I, I would say based on that, that I'm leaning in favor of eliminating restitution from this bill, simply because you're gonna require probation then to come back and be monitoring the restitution payments. And I'm not sure they'd wanna take that responsibility back on now that there's a restitution unit doing it for them. I think the wording here online, I think I have a different age number structure when I printed it off this morning, but I believe that the wording is that um, uh, a probationer shall not deem, be deemed ineligible for discharge or term reduction due to unpaid restitution fees or surcharges. So it doesn't put, it takes probation out of it, I think. They release the per they would, the judge would then release the person from probation based on everything else. And then the restitution unit would take over if the person fails to pay their restitution. It could result in a civil judgment, contempt of court, or whatever. That way, I'm hearing you, Bryn. Yes, that's how I. That's how I'm. Well, I, I think we leave it in. Yeah, it does it doesn't change the status quo on that, does it? No. It just it just says it can't be used as an excuse right. to deny somebody access to this. We uh, just finished the walkthrough. I think we're at section three of the reports. Sure. Um, so as Sarah mentioned this morning, because there's not data, uh, there's no, no existing data on how these midpoint reviews are, are panning out for people. This is a directive to the department um, that they uh, begin to collect data on the midpoint review process a year after um, this section would take effect. So that would be the number of probation discharge um, discharges or term reductions, the number of motions that are filed by the department to either discharge or reduce the term of probation, the number of probation terms that are reduced or terminated, and the amount of time that's reduced from probation terms as a result of these motions that are granted by the court. And then it requires two reports um, by August of 2022 and August of 2023 
by the department to the Justice Oversight Committee with um, the data that they've collected and any recommendations for further legislative action. Great. Um, any other questions for Ren or Sarah on this, on this particular provision? If not, we're going to take a break until 1030. Um, and at that time, we'll come back and take up S18, which is the earn good time and hear from um, family members of, of some victims. And then at 11, we take up S7 again, which is the expungement. So we'll take a break till 1030. Thank you. Hopefully I'll be um, back. <laughs> now, hopefully uh, you can get your techno technological problems fixed. And thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for uh, joining us this morning. We really yeah. appreciate yes. it. Thank you, Sarah. Nice thank to see you. you. Good to see you. We'll see you again Great soon. To see you all. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, my agenda, and, um, as uh, Taylor Fontaine is our first witness, and followed by Pamela Fontaine and then Ned Winterbottom and Joanne Winterbottom. Um, so if we could follow that, this is on S18, the bill dealing with uh, earned credit for good behavior. And the uh, those of you who uh, we, we've dealt with this uh, last week, Earlier, this I can't remember what week we're in already. Um, so, uh, Taylor, uh, welcome to Senate Judiciary Committee. I'll introduce the committee members for you and all the other the other three witnesses, and then we won't uh, need to do that again. But uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Dick Sears from Bennington County. I chair the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, Bill, maybe you could go next, and then. Uh, good morning. I'm Phil Baruth. I'm Senator from Chittenden County. Joe. Good morning. State Senator Joe Benning from Caledonia County. Senator Nitka. Alice Nitka from Windsor County and some other towns. Senator White is having technical difficulties this morning. Um, and uh, are you there, Senator White? She's been having technical difficulties and uh, getting into the Zoom uh, this morning, um, but uh, sure is, is listening. She's from Wyndham County. Taylor, please go ahead. Hello, everyone, and it's, um, excuse me, very nice meeting you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak in front of you. Sorry. Today, regarding Senate Bill 18, my name is Taylor Fontaine. I am an elementary school teacher. I am a friend. I am a daughter. I am a sister. I am a girlfriend. I am a coworker. I am a volunteer. I am a student. And among all these things that seem normal for my age, I am also a victim. I was 12 years old. Excuse me, this is still very hard for me. I was 12 years old when I was drugged and molested by Robert Kolobos at a sleepover at his house after a middle school dance. I was 13 years old when I testified in front of a courtroom filled, a filled courtroom on the most vulnerable time of my life. After hearing all 12 jurors say the man that turned my whole life upside down was guilty of the crimes he committed my whole body shook and tears streamed down my face. I was so relieved. He could never violate me again or anyone else for a very long time. But I would still live, have to live with this for the rest of my life. An adult made a decision, made the decision for me as a young girl to change my life forever in one of the worst ways. I struggled and I mean, I really struggled. I was trying to live the life of a normal teenager and now young adult while functioning with trauma. Trauma created by Robert Kolobos. I remember getting the call about the current good time rule being enacted. 
I was sitting in the school library during my planning time. I was confused at first because I had never heard of the good time rule. As I learned more about what it meant, my heart sank. I was assured by his guilty verdict that he would be in jail for a very long time and that my bravery at such a young age helped put an evil man behind bars. I relied upon his sentence to be able to try and heal to the best of my ability, knowing I wouldn't have to worry about him. All the wounds from the trauma I thought were starting to heal were cut open once again. The big question here is why the new changes proposed to this bill should be there. I want to reiterate that the one relief that I got was he was going to be in jail. He wasn't going to do this to me again. He wasn't going to do this to anyone else. I couldn't run into him for years to come. It was the one relief I got from something so traumatic. The one relief. An argument that I keep hearing over and over again for the reason this bill shouldn't be passed is that people change. And yes, people can change. But what doesn't change is the trauma endured by a victim. The trauma I endured at such a young age. The trauma I am still going through as a survivor of sexual assault. This coming May, it will be 13 years since my assault. 13 years later and I'm still dealing with it. Why should he have the ability to get out of jail earlier because of good behavior? He committed a crime, right? He was found guilty, right? The trauma doesn't end for me. And unfortunately, it never will. I don't have the luxury of behaving the way I'm supposed to so that my trauma goes away earlier. I don't have the ability to reduce my survivor sentence. I stand or sit rather in front of you today to share my story and advocate for victims like me now and to come and passage of the Senate Bill 18. I am hopeful that the right thing will be done to protect survivors like me. Thank you again for allowing me to speak in front of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taylor, very much for the testimony. Um, are there any questions for Taylor? So my only question is what was the minimum sentence provided to um, the perpetrator. For the lewd you know? and lascivious, it was yeah. 12 to 14 years. 12 to 14 years. 12 to 14. Thank you. Uh, Pam Fontaine, did you, are, are there any questions for Taylor? Pam, did you want to testify? Yes, please. Sure. So, hello, I'm Pam Plantain. I'm Taylor's Hi, mom. Sorry, it takes me a second because this brings back, just talking about this stuff brings back so much for Taylor and for our family. No, thank you so much for your bravery and both of you. I know it's not easy. Thank you, Mr. Sears. I appreciate that. Um, I actually want to start by saying that Taylor's bravery has helped so many people to be safe from a very dangerous man that was in our community. Taylor is a very courageous, loving and caring, intelligent young lady who has worked very hard within herself to find the peace and the strength that she needed to overcome being a victim to becoming a survivor. I am very proud of her and her power and her strength. I'm a parent. Can you imagine the moment you realize someone has hurt your child? I never thought I'd experience what I did that night after Taylor called crying 
and said she was scared, asked me to please come get her now. I'll never forget when I realized something more just happened to her than thinking she was just scared. Can you imagine that moment? This story started with a phone call, a phone call to me from Robert Kolobos himself asking, can Taylor sleep over after the dance tonight? What was about to unfold was not supposed to happen, not to my daughter, not to my family. Robert Kolobos was charged with lewd and lascivious conduct with a child and unlawful restraint. He drugged and molested Taylor. Can you imagine that? If I told you the whole story from that phone call to today, we'd be here for quite some time. Taylor's been through a lot. Our family's been through a lot. When Taylor just mentioned she, that she struggled, she struggled. It was real, it was hard, and it was strong. The trauma, the PTSD was like a volcano is all I can explain. Sometimes erupting in small spurts and other times like a like a full blown blast. We were her family and we struggled and erupted right along with her every single time. Even to this day when Taylor struggles. Taylor's sentence is embedded into her, an event that she cannot erase. One that she cannot have reduced for her good behavior no matter how hard she works, no matter how many counseling sessions she goes to, no matter, sorry, <laughs> no matter how much she contributes to society, she's a good citizen who deserves a sense of security and peace every day, all day. So we came here today in hopes that you will see and know that the Senate Bill 18 should come to passage to protect her and all of the other tailors in the world. Because there's more of them. I'll pray for you to make a mindful decision and not rush to do so. So many current and future victims deserve to be protected and to feel that their rights are considered first and foremost over their perpetrators rights. Thank you all for your hard work and for your consideration and for listening to us today. Thank you. I'm sorry, I muted myself. Uh -huh. I wanted to thank you for your testimony and ask if there's any questions. Thank you both so much for testifying today. And uh, I, I can only imagine, I, I can't say I know how difficult it is, I can only imagine the best of both of you as you um, seek recovery from this. Thank you. Senator Benning. Taylor, Pam, I want to thank you as well. I also want to say that I'm a criminal defense attorney for 37 years now, and I've never heard the term a victim's sentence. That is a really powerful statement and it is one that I promise you we will all take into account in trying to deal with this bill and put out something that makes sense. So thank you very much for testifying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those words. Um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Winterbottom, you're next and uh, so I, I don't know which one of you wants to go first. But uh, I have Ned first, and then um, Joanne, but it's up to you. I think you're muted, sir. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute them. Oh, you muted them. I did mute them, uh, and now I'm trying to unmute them. <laughs> uh, 
I think we succeeded. Oh, I think we got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this morning, Mr. and Mrs. Wiggenbottom. I really appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, my name is Ned Winterbottom. I'm the father of Laura Kate Winterbottom. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify to you today on Senate Bill 18. My family and I uh, support this bill. We want to especially thank Attorney General T.J. Donovan for his support and his integrity. Um, Commissioner Jim Baker for really listening to us. Um, Senator Sears for sponsoring the bill and for all the committee members who are willing to um, be open to reconsider it or in good time. While we recognize the need for prison reform, we strongly object to the application of earned good time to rapists, murderers, and pedophiles in the Vermont prison system. We can understand and even support some of the goals of justice reinvestment. The more we learn about this subject, the more we understand that these are complicated issues that you guys have to struggle with and that sometimes in trying to solve one problem, perhaps another one is created. We appreciate the fact there's a willingness to, at this time to listen to victims' voices and to revisit the issues associated with earning good time, keeping in mind the perspective of victims. Our daughter, Laura Kate Winterbottom, was kidnapped, raped, and brutally murdered, and I mean brutally murdered in Burlington on March 8th, 2005 by Gerald Montgomery. Because of the brutality of this crime, he was charged with aggravated murder, which carries a sentence of life without parole. A plea agreement was negotiated under which he would plead guilty to first degree murder and receive a sentence of 43 years to life. The prosecutors informed us that if the plea agreement was not acceptable to us, they would pursue the charge of aggravated murder at trial, and because of the DNA and other overwhelming evidence, their case was very, very solid. We were advised that the trial would involve making all public all the graphic details of the extreme brutality inflicted upon Laura, and also our enduring the ordeal of listening to Montgomery's counsel attempt to defend his savage, undefensible crime against her. We were assured that 43 years was a minimum Montgomery would have to serve before becoming eligible for parole, parole, and that he would have to successfully complete a course of treatment for sexual offenders before he would be eligible for parole. We were not told about our good time because it did not exist at the time. We obviously were not told that 15 years later, the 43 year, old, 40, 43 year minimum would be retroactively changed without adequate notice to potentially dramatically reduce it. This was a very painful and difficult time for us. And we were in deep and profound grief over Laura's death. We relied heavily on the representation of the state's attorney's office and the Burlington Police Department, both of whom were actually wonderful. And we trusted them to seek justice for Laura and act in our best interest. After much deliberation and in reliance on those representations, we agreed to accept the plea agreement. The rape and murder of our law were savage crimes and in deliberately committing them, we believe that Montgomery forfeited his right to any reduction whatsoever in his sentence. We learned during the course of hearings that he had previously sexually assaulted at least two other women that we know of. When he took Laura's life, he permanently changed the lives of everyone in our family in profoundly irreparable ways. I agree with that term, victims of sentence, and that's what we have. Laura is no longer, has, she has a lifetime sentence. She lost her life. Her sentence was death. There was no such thing as healing from the death of a child, especially a death like Laura's. Life is never the same, but you carry on. It was, however, very important for us to know that Montgomery was safely behind bars for at least 43 years. And therefore, we could turn not our focus not on him, but rather on preventing the type of crimes he committed. This certainty 
helped us to establish the Laura Kate Winterbottom Memorial Fund, a Vermont-based foundation with a mission of ending sexual violence and helping survivors. To date, with the support of thousands of people, the LKW Fund has raised and donated over $225,000 to organizations in Vermont and programs that support that mission. What we can determine from a review of the legislation and the Department of Correction report on the legislation entitled Availability of Good Time, dated 12 15, 2019. There are two primary reasons advanced for the retroactive application of earned good time system that alters the sentence and plea bargain for currently incarcerated offenders. One, the claim that increased participation, this is a quote, increased participation will have a greater impact on prison morale and behavior, close quote. And two, a need to avoid, quote, increased administrative burden, close quote. We submit that neither reason is adequate to justify a system which effectively alters the plea bargain minimum sentence of a brutal murderer and serial and has the potential to release a violent, repeated sexual predator and murderer back into the population 6.5 years short of his minimum sentence. The report of the United States Sentence Commission to Congress from 2016 to 2019 for federal prisoners shows that violent criminals and those with a serious criminal history are at a significant risk of repeated crimes with a recidivism rate of over 80%. A Bureau of Justice study has shown that 10% of at least murderers in 30 states commit another crime within six months of release and 48% commit another crime within five years of release. The 2019 US Sentence Commission report on recidivism among violent federal offenders so that even released offenders over 50 years of age with a serious criminal or violent history have a 37% chance of committing another crime within five years of release. This means that during the 6.5 years that Montgomery could potentially be released earlier than his minimum sentence, there is an over 37% chance he will submit another crime. Given his history of violent sexual assaults and murder, there is a significant risk that he will rape or possibly murder another woman. That is a risk we are not prepared to sanction on the basis of prison morale or avoidance of an administrative burden. And we don't think the state of Vermont should do that either. While we understand the goal of making a criminal justice system more fair and a correction system more humane, we also believe that there are offenders in the correction system, such as rapists, murderers, and pedophiles, whose criminal thinking, history, and propensity for violence make them a dangerous society and a significant risk for future crimes. Many such offenders are violent psychopaths or sociopaths, people for which psychologists tell us there was little, if any, possibility of significant positive change. We have heard Senator Sears at a previous hearing of the Joint Legislative Oversight Committee say that we should lock up people who are dangerous, not those who are a pain in the neck. We agree. We assert that the corollary to this statement is that we shouldn't release early before they have completed their full minimum sentence those offenders who are truly dangerous, like General Montgomery. He must make need to serve his full sentence because that is as it should be, considering the severity and barbarity of his crime, justice for Laura, and the genuine concern for the protection of society demand nothing less. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. I appreciate how difficult it must be for you, Mr. Meyer, today. I appreciate it. Um, are there any questions for? Mrs. Winterbond. Well, thank you. I'm Joanne, Laura's mother. Sorry. Oh, James. No, you're fine. Oh, okay. okay. So that was somebody else. That... So, um, first, we want to. I, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify. 
on Senate Bill 18. Um, I appreciate, we appreciate this opportunity more than we can possibly express. Uh, I'm fully in support of this bill to amend earned good time. Our daughter, Laura, was abducted and over several hours repeatedly raped and sodomized and then strangled manually and bludgeoned to death with a wooden board by Gerald Montgomery in Burlington on March 8th, 2005. As Ned had mentioned, Montgomery was initially charged with aggravated murder. And on the advice of the state's attorney's office, and after much deliberation and in good faith in the integrity of the Vermont judicial system, we agreed to accept a plea agreement. Montgomery pleaded guilty to first degree murder and accepted the sentence of 43 years to life imposed upon him by Judge Cooper Smith. In support of Senate Bill 18, I would like to make five points. One, the state of Vermont should be ethically and judicially obliged to honor the agreement it made with us in imposing Montgomery's sentence. Attorney General T.J. Donovan has made it clear that he is in agreement with us in regard to this issue. And I and my family are grateful for his acknowledgement of this agreement and applaud, and applaud his integrity. My second point, is that violent offenders and murderers should be excluded from earned good time. In his attack on Laura, Montgomery actually committed three distinct crimes, abduction, rape, and murder. His violation and bludgeoning of her were deliberate, vicious, and merciless. The willfulness the willfulness and savagery of his crimes should negate his right to any reduction whatsoever of his sentence. Moreover, we learned during the course of hearings that he had previously sexually assaulted at least two other women. So he was in fact a repeat offender. My third point, in the meeting of January 13th, of this year, 2021, to consider amending the policy, the issue of the indelicate method used to apprise victims and their survivors of the policy was raised as well as the consideration of changing the insensitive name of the policy. While these assuredly need reconsideration, my focus is on Senate Bill 18 per se. Fourth point. In response to the comment made in the meeting of January 13 that people can change, I respectfully submit that there is no unanimity of opinion among experts in the scientific community that all people can change. It is a complex issue involving many factors. In regard specifically to violent sex offenders like Montgomery, there is overwhelming evidence that they do not change their proclivities and behavior. The, recidiv the recidivism rate for sex offenders is very high. Montgomery, in fact, as we've mentioned, is a repeat offender who progressed from sexual assaults to murder. Releasing him into the community before his full sentence is served is an assault on the principles of truth and justice that are cornerstones of an optimally functioning civilized society. An early release poses a risk that should not be sanctioned. And my fifth point, in response to the testimony given on Friday, January 15th, I am feeling that while there was verbal acknowledgement of the rights of victims, there was more concern with the rights of offenders. Words like disparity, and inconsistency and statements regarding potential litigation around perceived unfair practices and statements regarding potential complications around plea agreements were stressed and each in reference to offenders in conjunction with the proposal to amend earned good time. 
In my opinion, an emphasis on the rights of offenders constitutes a gross and egregious imbalance of justice and power. In our particular case, the reality is that Laura is a victim with absolutely no rights or power at all. Her voice cannot be heard. She is dead because heinous crimes were committed against her. We, Laura's family, are advocating for her and urging the passage of Senate Bill 18. The current earn good time policy as it would apply to our Laura's murderer disturbs us to our core and makes us feel re-victimized. When Montgomery ended Laura's life, he forever changed my life, my husband's, my daughter Lee's and my son Aaron's. We in fact are serving a relentlessly painful lifetime sentence. Allowing him to qualify for an earlier release is not acceptable to us. And it is certainly not in the interest or pursuit of fairness and accountability. Our request is simple and threefold. That Vermont honor the agreement it entered upon with us when Montgomery, when Montgomery was sentenced. That he not be given the privilege of eligibility for good time and that Senate Bill 18 be passed. And thank you again for allowing me to uh, express my opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your thought. Senator White has a comment or question. I just um, have a question and I appreciate very much all of your testimony and how painful um, not only the acts were, but how painful it is for you to relive them now by testifying to us. So. Thank you very much. My question is, when I'm looking at S18, is that there are a number of disqualifying events in there, and one of them is manslaughter. They are, so I guess my question is, do you support the bill as it is with all of the disqualifying events, or would you um, be more focused on certain um, crimes that should not be given good time? Well, I, I, I would speak for, uh, for myself, which is that I'm speaking about our case. I don't mm -hmm. purport to speak for all victims. There may be victims of manslaughter who feel like we do too, but we're not we're not in that place. I mean, when we first heard about Good and Good Time, a lot of people contacted us and wanted to talk to us about it. And we basically said, uh, talk to Crime Victim Services and maybe your voice will be heard. We want to speak for ourselves about that issue. I know uh, Attorney General Donovan was instrumental in putting that list together. I have a lot of faith in him. He's a good man. And if that's his judgment, that's his judgment. I, I wouldn't question it at all. Thank you. Anyway, we wouldn't purport to speak for other victims. Um, I agree with what Ned has said. Thank you. Just to make, and I know you were clear, um, just to make clear, um, those who may be also listening, when we use the term retroactive, it, people who were sentenced do not earn good time, would not earn good time, to a period already served for uh, January 1st, 2020. So just to make clear the, the term retroactive, some might mean that they were going all the way back to the sentence. It actually begins January 1, 2021. If this bill passes, um, the, uh, that would end. They would not earn the good. Those folks would not earn the good time. But nobody who was currently incarcerated prior to December 31st, 2020 would earn any good time. I don't know if that was... I hope that's clear to those that may be listening. I don't know what's clear. For us, Senator, I, I, we were clear about that. What we meant was that- No, I know you were, but when we use the term retroactive, people might think that he would have earned good time for the 15 years he already served prior to the enactment of, of the bill. I just wanted to make that clear to anybody. I think you were very clear about it that it started. Okay. Um, 
I thank you, all four of you, so much for joining us today. And um, I really appreciate your testimony. It's very important to us to hear all sides. Um, I will say that, that some of the offenses listed here, I think the biggest concern is that we not end up with unintended consequences. Uh, someone who, um, due to an age gap in some of the offenses, and, and that was simply why they were charged. I think that was some of the subject last week that people were looking at. With that, I, I thank you very much. Are there any other questions for any of the four witnesses? Thanks so much again. No, thank you for coming forward. We will continue to work on S18 next week. It's a priority for us. It needs to be one of those bills that we get passed as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you.